Hmm. Why, well, hello there. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Roger Windfall. Here in place of that uh, Y Ruler Chun, in order to review, um, what was it called? A Mango. No, Manga. Mandem? Mange? A Chinese comic book. It's Japanese. A Japanese comic book called Prince of Tennis. Now, of course, as soon as I heard the title, I highly doubted it was about a real prince. After all, I would have met him at one of my parties. <laughs> of course, as soon as I began reading, or at least once I got used to this backwards oriental layout, my suspicions were confirmed. Not only is this not about a prince at all, it's about little ruffians playing tennis. What respectable club allows middle school hooligans onto its courts? What sort of example is this story setting? If the image of middle school as being allowed to play tennis is made too popular, think of the consequences. My club might have to get rid of its guard dogs! Fortunately, among all the rabble, I found the hero of this story, a respectable young gentleman named Atabe, who has quite a sense of style. There is a memorable scene in which he flies to school in a private stealth plane before parachuting onto the building's roof, using a parachute with his name emblazoned on it, no less. What? What do you mean he's not the hero? Arrogant? No sense of fair play? Oh, I'm so sick of modern fiction or worse portraying the upper class so negatively. Oh, I refuse to soil myself with this work any further. The nerve of that man! Wow. It took him way less time to leave than I thought it would. Okay, so the reason I temporarily brought in Prep Boy today was to demonstrate how a story can be related many different ways depending on the impressions and intentions of the person providing the description. It doesn't even have to be a story, really. Any description will be affected by the describer, whether by using a positive or negative tone when describing it, or just not bringing up certain aspects of the thing in question. So if I were to describe tennis, I would say that it's an athletic sport consisting of two to four people hitting a ball back and forth across a net, that there are a lot of etiquette-related rules, and that the scoring system is unnecessarily overcomplicated. On the other hand, Prince of Tennis mangaka Konomi Takashi would describe it as this blood sport played exclusively by incredibly attractive boys. He wouldn't even be able to tell you how it's scored, he'd just say that the score changes arbitrarily in order to build tension, or to ensure that whatever player he wants to win will. The fact that he injects flashy martial arts and copious amounts of violence to was most certainly one of the least dangerous athletic sports in the world demonstrates that Konomi Takashi has a very poor sense of what makes tennis what it is. This will be a glaring flaw on its own, except that Konomi also supplements it by having a very poor cast of completely unengaging characters, having no sense of pacing whatsoever, and having flashy moves that are the trademark of the series, which aren't awe-inspiring but are simply laughable. And what few redeeming qualities there are, are almost completely drowned out by the series' far more numerous and far more noticeable flaws. But enough of the intelligent criticism, let's get back to bashing this piece of crap. Welcome back to Red Right to Left. When we last left our heroes, the Seigaku Middle Tennis Team, they had just defeated the reigning Japanese national champions, Rikai. There's this long preamble to the preceding national tournament, mostly of the different teams preparing for it, but we also get a bunch of one-chapter-long stories, including one where this random girl from another school comes along and starts stalking the main character, Echizen Ryoma. <laughs> this cover page showing her together with Echizen seriously got colored like four times right after the internet got his hands on it, which is pretty funny because she's just a one-shot character. The people who bought that Ryoma's girlfriend title must have jumped to conclusions faster than those who shipped Zuko with that one random Earth Kingdom girl. Then again, there weren't very many Zuko shippers who weren't also crazy Zutara fans. But anyway, let's get back to what I'm supposed to be talking about. It turns out that the girl was just a spy who was trying to get information on Echizen's abilities, but Echizen saw through her because he's not a total moron. The reason I bring up this otherwise entirely forgettable chapter is that Sakuno brings up to Echizen that she noticed he wasn't playing like he usually does, which earns her a sort of subtle compliment from Echizen for being observant. It's a fairly cute moment which prompted me to ask why the hell doesn't Sakuno show up for more than once every 50 chapters? I actually like her! On to actually relevant stuff, we get a few chapters focusing on the introduction of this guy to Yama Kintaro. Immediately after being introduced, he gets harassed by some bullies. <sighs> Sure, he's going to just use tennis to get out of this situation in a way that makes no goddamn sense. Oh my god! Jesus Christ! Just first a brick out of the wall and beats the crap out of him with it. 
God damn. Forget the fact that he's as absurd as Edges, and this is what Jonah Hears are supposed to be like. He just goes around using his apparent super strength to beat up anyone who acts like a dick, and he actually broadcasts a full range of emotions. Yeah, let's consider this as having been a retroactive wapachyopagyaf. I mean, he's like Edison, except instead of having this disgustingly cocky smirk all the time, he has an interesting personality, which is a real rarity in Prince of Tennis. But we gotta get back to the crafts, as the only other consequential thing that happens in this set of chapters is that Tezuka returns from surgery to repair his injured shoulder. However, because Oishi's a bitch, he demands that Tezuka play a match with him to see if Tezuka's really fit to play. Oishi's condition, if Tezuka loses even one game, he can't play in the Nationals. Are you really that used to him handing you your own ass? One game? Why the hell is Oishi on this team again? It, be it can't be because of his skills, since he sucks. It can't be because of his hardiness, since his injury acts up so much. I know he's supposed to, you know, fulfill the overprotective team mom role towards his teammates, but he threw that out the window when he punched his own doubles partner in the face for pointing out his shirt was on Inside Out. God, I hate Oishi! Okay, so we get a quick training montage from all the different characters, and then the Nationals start. Sagaku ends up having a bye for the first round, so they instead watch Rokaku's first match against the new team, Higa. Rokaku's players get their asses handed to them because Higa's players can all apparently teleport around the court. Plus, they're all dicks and one of them deliberately brains Rokaku's coach with the ball. He did it because... they had to demonstrate that they're assholes. Anyways, coincidence would have it, Sagaku plays against Higa in the next round, which sort of qualifies as a grudge match. Echizen plays first, and his opponent is this really big guy. Since Echizen's also an asshole, he immediately insults him. Hey, shouldn't you go on a diet? WHAT DID YOU SAY?! You should also watch out for the post-diet rebound. Huh. Well, all we need is a Latino gamer, a music critic, and a guest, and we'll have an episode of Transmission Awesome. Unsurprisingly, this nearly leads to a physical confrontation, which results in Higa's captain saying, in a genuine, serious attempt to be intimidating, that everyone on the team knows Okinawan martial arts. Yes, he seriously tries to be intimidating by saying this. I know kung fu. Anyway, Seigaku ends up having no trouble with this team. In all, it's really boring since Seigaku doesn't lose even once. At one point, Kikumaru breaks the laws of physics and the rules of tennis. Since Oishi is injured, Kikumaru has decided that he's not going to play doubles again until Oishi heals, since he doesn't want a different partner. Yeah, way to act in the team's best interest, you selfish prick. So Kikumaru plays in a singles match, but has trouble getting used to it. So he uses that weird step of his that makes him appear to be in two different places at once, but then he uses it while serving so he can basically play doubles with himself. So the idea is that he can move quickly back and forth to appear as if he's in two places at once. But he can also do this while standing still. I got nothing. So Segaku wins the first three of five sets to clinch the team victory, but the teams keep playing for some reason. Kaido and Inui, my favorite doubles pair in the whole series, win their match, but it's entirely off-panel. Thanks a lot, Konomi. So then Tezuka plays against Higa's captain, and this is the match where the shit really hits the fan, because Tezuka uses this even more absurd variation of the state of self-actualization. You may recall from my last video on Prince of Tennis that Edges and developed the ability to access this legendary state. Somehow Tezuka is able to concentrate this state, which is apparently just straight up a magic aura, into his arm, creating the pinnacle of hard work. The way it was originally presented, you could sort of interpret the state of self-actualization as being what its name implied, a sort of zen mindset, but when they start talking about, you know, energy gathering to different parts of the body, that goes out the window, and Prince Tess officially becomes Dragon Ball Z with tennis rackets. Supposedly the pinnacle of hard work allows Tezuka to, get this, return any shot hit to him with twice the power and spin as the shot he received. There's no adequate explanation as to how this works, so I'm just going to say it's plot magic. So of course Tezuka wins, and almost immediately afterwards, Seigaku has to play a rematch with Hyote. The first match is between Momoshiro and a glasses-wearing player named Oshitari. There's some BS about how Momoshiro learned how to read his opponent's movements, but he can't read Oshitari for some reason, which makes the whole thing entirely pointless. At one point while chasing after a ball, Momoshiro runs like an extra three meters beyond the edge of the court and slams his head into a pole. Look, the core line isn't even on panel when he runs into it. Why the hell did he run that far? In the end, Oshitari has his racket blown away by Momoshiro's power, but at the same time he returns the ball and gets the match point. Despite one of the rules of tennis being that if you drop your racket, then you automatically lose the point. Nice to know you did your research, Konomi! After that, Kaido and Inui play a doubles match and win in the span of all of three chapters. Seriously, their opponents realize that the best way to beat them is to win the match quickly so as not to get worn out or reveal their weaknesses. But they get worn out anyway. And then when Kaido and Inui actually make their comeback, we don't actually see a damn wink of it. So then Tezuka plays singles against Kabaji, who is infamous for copying his opponent's techniques. 
Not too far into the match, Kabaji manages to copy not only the Tezuka Zone, but even the pinnacle of hard work, so the two of them constantly return each other's shots with double the power ad infinitum. Damn it, if you guys keep going, you're going to make the game glitch out. 